Thank you for joining us online today. Here at the House of the Lord, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if you have a testimony that you'd like to share with us, please email amen at hotl.church. If this house has impacted you anyway, and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click on the top right to give. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. How many of you realize that you have been immersed in such a culture of, of fear and division and uncertainty, and it's almost like sometimes it just takes you to just, just trying to get out of your house and realize, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to feel it, and you just got to go home and take a shower. I mean, seriously. But you know, this is what I, I believe the Lord is doing, is when we gather together in His community, and He's wanting to just pour out His Spirit on us afresh because we need to be washed with the water of His Word. Amen. Amen. We need to be washed and encouraged with the water of His Word. Can I have something to drink? Um, there's a water thing. There's no coffee. She's going to throw coffee at me. She says, coffee. At, if, she, if she wants me to drink coffee, that means I probably should pick it up a little bit as far as the prayer. You need some coffee. But let me, let me get into this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. Paul is saying, finally, after all this, finally, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes, somebody say schemes, of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So once again, I'm going to wrap this thing up. And it's, it, it's kind of crazy because this is like a famous passage that talks about armor, talks about warfare, talks about preparation which are, you know, things for men all kind of like, ooh, yeah, you know, we, we get all woke up, you know, it's like, whoa, armor. And, and I'm thinking about this and praying about this, and I realize how much that we guard stuff in the natural. We guard stuff in the natural. We're thinking, we got alarms on our cars. I mean, come on, seriously, your, your car will go off if like you don't put your seatbelt on. You know, it's like the little, the little, you know, the beep, 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 beep. Your car goes off. Like if, if the, how many of you ever experienced the check engine light? It's, it's telling you that there's built in stuff. Now I've actually realized that as I'm getting older, the check engine light comes on a little more often. I was, I was talking to one of the older gentlemen in our congregation. He says, when you get my age, it stays on all the time. But we guard stuff. We have car alarms, we have our homes, we have security systems. I was out, I was out um, spending some time with a, with a brother, and you know, he's got his phone out, and he's got one of those ring, ring things on his, you know, the, that you can see everything. And he's like, yeah, you know, oh yeah, so a FedEx guy just showed up with a, with a package. I'm like, you're 200 miles away, and you got this thing that can show you whatever's going on. Oh yeah, deer just walked by. My, I was like, that's why you have it on. There's a sophisticated game camera, bro. That's why you really have it on there. But so we, we, we have all of this stuff. We have insurance on everything. Identity theft, identity lock. Most homes in North Idaho or Eastern Washington are better armed than a lot of third world countries, Right? And, and I've been out, you know, doing a little bow hunting this, this fall. And uh, man, I got my bow and I got my, my bear spray and I got my, my, my pistol on my hip. I mean, I'm, I'm loaded for bear, right? I'm ready. Uh, 
because I don't want to take any chances. I might encounter something out there that I don't expect. I actually, actually a couple years ago, I had a cougar sneak right up behind me. It was 30 yards away. And you know what happened? I shot him. I did. He was dead. You got to be prepared, right? I mean, you got to be prepared. And so I, I was showing my hunting buddy what I carry in my pack. Now, women carry lots of stuff in their purse, right? I mean, if I need stuff, I'm somewhere and I'm like, mm, honey, do you got a bandage? Up, oh, just let me, do, do you have some tile? Yep, let me do I mean, she's, I don't know all the stuff she has in that purse, but men, they have lots of stuff in their packs. So we're sitting, we're taking a little break, we're hunting, and I'm like, and he goes, man, I says, I need a little, do you have a little tool? I said, yeah, I got a tool. I reach in there and I, I pull out this multi-tool. And then I started pulling, we just started pulling stuff out. I guess we were bored. The elk weren't bugling. I don't know what's going on. But I'm pulling out stuff. I'm going, yeah, I got, I got a knife. I got a tool. I got duct tape. Yes, I got duct tape in my backpack. You live in Idaho, you got to have some duct tape in your backpack. I got an emergency blanket. I got fire starter. I got everything. I got rubber. I got everything in there. No wonder that thing weighs 35 pounds, 40 pounds. And people also prepare, right? I mean, they got, we have generators. We have dry goods. We have cash on hand. We got a safe in the shop. We got a safe in the house. We have several gallons of fuel. We have a pantry full of stuff. And if you don't have a pantry full of stuff, you should know somebody that does. That's how I roll. My buddy was telling me, oh yeah, we got this, we got that. I'm like, address, note your address, because something happens, I'm coming to your house. Right? But here's the thing, all the preparation, all the guarding, all the armament, and so many believers don't put on the whole armor of God. They don't. I call the message... Dress for success because there's a way. I was actually reminded of a Mark Twain quote. He said, clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. Seriously, that is such a great quote. I've memorized it. Because it's so true, right? I mean, I mean if we look at this, we, we realize, okay, and, you know, and then there's images in your head, and you're like, I cannot unsee what I just saw again. But they're, naked people are actually, it means something's wrong, or, it, or it's embarrassing, or it's just like, what? I mean, the TV shows don't even, like, the, like you watch a football game, and some guy strips and runs across the field. They don't even show that anymore because they realize that is not a good visual. <laughs> that does not sell, you know, cars or whatever. But if you think about this, if we have a bunch of well-dressed people in the natural and naked spiritually all the while that armor has been ready, because that's what we're talking about. How about families where, you know, when Robbie and I were married, there was a point in time where I'm just trying to get by for Jesus. I got my fire insurance and and she's just plugged in and she's reading the Bible and she's in community and she's praying all the time and listening to worship music. And, it, you know, when I look at it now, I feel like, man, what was I thinking? I'm thinking that her armor is going to protect me. Mm-mm, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Spiritually naked people have little or no influence in the world. They have little or no influence in the world. And you know what a harsh verse in the Bible that addresses that? In 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. So there's these challenges and preparations that we need to make in the natural, but Paul defines our war as spiritual. And so many times we We don't grasp that. It says in verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. My bear spray may work with a bear, but it's not going to work with the scheme of the enemy. It's not going to work when I'm encountering spiritual warfare or that I don't recognize it. What's happening right now like if we, you know, a lot of times when, how many of you have ever like, okay, for married people, how many of you have ever had an argument with your spouse 
and then kind of went, what in the heck were we arguing about? Come on. Well, you know what? The, the thing is that you have an enemy that tries to kill, steal, and destroy. And so when, when we're in those kind of conflicts, we have to go, okay, what, what is really happening here? Do we, have, do we see the overall spiritual strategy and scheme? And then so many times we're wrestling and we totally neglect the spiritual influence of what is happening. It's like taking a knife to a gunfight. And we get ourselves caught up in fighting against people instead of contending and standing against the, the schemes, the spirit, and the agenda of, of the devil. See, you and I were not anointed to win arguments. There's not a shelf in your house, or there shouldn't be a shelf in your house that's, that's where the all argument trophies go. It's like I've got a taxidermist friend of mine that lives right across the street, and it'd be like me going over and say, bro, dude, I won this argument on social media. Is at least a 300, he scored at least 350 points. Can you like put this on the wall for me? That's not what our anointing is about. But yet we do it all the time. We engage it all the time. And we forget that the very people we're supposed to reach out are the ones we're contending with. We're actually called to disciple. Right? Jesus said, go into all the nations discipling, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what happens, what meters my response to any situation is how does this come into the framework of discipleship? And usually, I have to back up. In my mind, I'm warring furiously with somebody. It's just, ugh. but I can't because I'm measured by the Holy Spirit. I do believe there are principalities and illegitimate spiritual influences over regions, over states, over nations. I've seen it. For example, I believe there's a spirit of pornography over Hollywood. Gambling and addiction over Las Vegas, Nevada. Suicide. Do you know that Las Vegas is actually the highest rate of suicide in the nation? That's a spirit. That's a principality. That's, I, I've been to nations where there's a spirit of poverty over them. I've been to places where there's a, like that slave trade. And, and you know, I mean, just, just nasty, evil, wicked stuff. And you realize this isn't heaven. This is, this is basically, this is from hell and it's manifesting on the earth. And we have to contend against that stuff. I was kind of explaining the spiritual principle a number of years ago to my sons and they were both in high school. We were moving to Idaho to pastor. And, and you know, so I tell them and, they, and, 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 and then they said, well, dad, what, what spirit do you think is over the state of Idaho? And then my younger son pipes up and he says, I think it's the spirit of the potato. No, you didn't get it. We're in a battle whether we want to engage or we want to pretend it's not there. The, e the enemy is scheming. He's manipulating, maneuvering. He's looking for places to sow division and destruction. Everywhere we go, there's the chance, the opportunity for division. We see it. We see it on all fronts, political, health care, all kinds of stuff. But what we have to re be reminded of is our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers, authorities that are actually motivating what we're walking through. And the good news is that God has an armor system in place. And he wouldn't have created it unless it was needed so he knew it was needed. The challenge is we need to, uh, to utilize it and, it, and it's a good one. So Paul is writing this, and most likely Paul has been chained to a Roman soldier for three years. So he's getting a first-hand look at armor. I mean, he's an expert on armor. He's been living this close with armor. And he uses all of this imagery and illustrations. And some of this is also pulled from the book of Isaiah. Others is pulled from uh, Psalms. So there's this imagery that he's actually trying to illustrate to us a spiritual truth. And I want to say this, that 
all of this armor, you'll see this, can really be summed up in one word. Because at times we try to think of, okay, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece. And yes, that's true. But it's all summed up in one name. And that's Jesus. I'm going to show you that. It actually says in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So we're putting, we're putting as we put him on, there's things that just come with walking with Jesus. First of all, it's the belt of truth. Okay, now, it's not like the belt that maybe you and I put on this morning. It's actually the belt in, in that armor would be a, a super heavy, thick piece of leather that would actually, it would actually cr- it would protect your most vulnerable parts. It would, it would protect you from a, a sword of the enemy or a spear coming in and, you know, eviscerating you. Spilling your guts all over the place. Okay, so the vulnerability there. But it also would hold all of the other place, all the other pieces in place. That's where you would hang your sword. It would, uh, it would attach to the breastplate of righteousness. And so it was so fundamental. It was so, it was so, it's like that's the most necessary. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do out with one, look at that because you can't hardly do with the others without it. Jesus is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We see the truth embodied in Jesus. We also see that the Word of God is truth. The truth, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. It's truth, okay? It's the belt of truth. It's not, the truth of God is not evolving. It's not fake news. It's the standard. The world's standards may have changed. You may be called old-fashioned with your values and with your morals, but you have to say, this is the truth because everything else shifts. What used to be bad is now called good. What used to be good is now called bad in our culture. And we are swimming through this thing at every turn. And you gotta, you got to recognize that, 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 that this is the truth. The belt of truth guards against deceptions. It guards against lies. And it's interesting that the belt would not only protect like the intestines, but also would protect the re- reproductive organs. Okay? Like from, from, the very, from, from the place that where you bring life has got to be truth. Because if, you, if, if you're bringing, like, how many of you recognize a lie begets a lie? Deception begets deception? I mean, how many of you, back in the day, you recognize that, okay, wow, I just told a little lie. Mm. But now you got to do another one because it actually reproduces itself. It's kind of crazy how that goes. You know, we live in a culture that it's really hard to tell the truth, right? I mean, pfft. How many times have you been in a situation, you know the truth, and you like avoid it or whatever because there is a culture that we live in that's not a truthful culture. So you have to have the belt of truth as part of your armor. It combats deception, speaks of living truthfully, and if you want to see victory in your spiritual life, you're going to have to start with God's view on the matter. Not someone else's view. Not even so many times your view. Because sometimes our views are shaped by our emotions. Okay? If it feels good, do it. Well, if it feels good, it must be good. Like, no. What is produced in your life needs to be foundational truth, and what you bring to life is full of truth. The next one is the breastplate of righteousness. Here's where we're going to tie Jesus in. Jesus is our righteousness. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Man, I love that. Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. Putting this on speaks of being in right standing before God. See, what this means is that how many of you have been ashamed of some stuff that you did? Okay. Right. I mean, we've all sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, so what happens is that to be in right standing between God 
God has looked at that life that we had and He said, now wait a minute, time out. I'm going to actually take what Jesus did on the cross and now I'm going to apply it to you so that He becomes our righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that we can just live like hell. It's not doesn't mean some sort of greasy, gracie thing and no big deal because God's going to forgive me. But it means that the righteousness of Jesus basically being imputed to us, has sanctified us, and now we can actually live with the confidence that we're in right standing with God. It's like, yeah, it just feels good to be right with God. And we didn't do it ourselves. We couldn't do it. He did it for us. And so when we, when we look at this, it, it speaks of being able to stand our ground because now you have a confidence in that relationship. How many of you have ever had kind of a kerfuffle? That's a really cool word. Thought I'd use it. <clears throat> Means fight for some of you. It's like, what in the world? Was that a Greek word, Hebrew word? No, kerfuffle. I think it came from Canada. Um, <laughs> anyway, how many of you have had like, you know, this contested relationship with somebody and you realize, man, I, don't, I, I can't make this right. They won't make this right. And there's a tension there's just something there that's not right. And then when you get through it and you realize, hey, we're good. Woo, we're good, right? Doesn't it feel good? That's what we're talking about. It's like, man, that feels so good because I, I couldn't do it on my own, but Jesus did what I couldn't do. And now I'm in right standing with God and I can walk with a confidence And basically, it just protects you against a bunch of stuff like condemnation. Okay? So that's a breastplate of righteousness. And then how about the shoes for your feet? The the readiness of the gospel, the gospel of peace. There's so much imagery here. The Roman soldier would have these really heavy sandals, and then he'd put nails in the soles so that if he got in battle, he could stand. You ever tried to do anything like athletic with sandals on oh man every once in a while forget i'm i got sandals on and boom i'm you know whatever just like it doesn't work how could these guys fight with sandals they need like kenetrek boots something you can really lace up or some blacks boots you know what i'm saying but they would basically have these heavy leather sandals and they and it's so they could stand there was something listen if you if you've ever been an athlete or a coach you realize footwork is about everything I mean, one of the first things we teach kids when we're teaching them how to play football or or throw a baseball ride or basically basketball is like, here's what you do with your feet, okay? I mean, I remember in junior high, I don't know what in the world got into me, but I decided I was going to be a wrestler. Do I look like I'm built like a wrestler? I mean, I was this like string pole kid. And they said, you know, I'd be in like, you know, 150, 140 pound weight class and I'm like six foot two or whatever. And these little guys, you know, with muscles and all that, and like I take down getting ready to happen. But one of the first things they teach you is balance, is stance. Everything that you do is stance, whether you're shooting a bow, whether you're shooting a gun, whether you're, I mean, everything is about your stance. You're lifting weights. It's about your footwork. This is what this is talking about. You've got to understand the necessity of your footwork. It also speaks of being settled in the peace of God. Now this is something sometimes we don't grasp out of this passage of Scripture. But it talks about the gospel of peace. And I, I believe that as we walk, the Bible says a man makes his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. Right? Right? Steps of a righteous man. Who righteous. Right relationship. Breastplate of righteousness is ordered by the Lord. And what happens is that you can confidently move forward in some of these decisions that you're making in life. Some of these directions. Some of the, is this an open door? Is this a closed door? Is this where I'm supposed to be? You basically look for the peace of God. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be some challenges and some hurdles that you overcome. But I'm telling you what, you can overcome a lot of stuff as long as you walk in peace. And this is part of putting on the whole armor of God. Being guided. Or the shield of faith. Shield of faith is a powerful image. Faith simplified is trusting God, 
His purposes, His plans and promises. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is not this ethereal thing, like this dreamy thing. Uh, faith is, is, is the culmination of so many things that basically the promises, the Word, the testimony, what God's brought you to, it just all reinforces this, and pretty soon you're walking in this faith. I'm trusting. So when we look at the shield of faith, a soldier's shield in that time that, that Paul was chained to would be about four feet high and it would be about two feet wide. That soldier could actually hide completely behind that shield. Now, that shield was made up of leather stretched over a framework, tight. And, and, and what, would do, what, what the soldiers would do is they would soak that in water to the point where it would be so saturated that the flaming arrows of the enemy would be extinguished when they would hit that shield. Now, here's the cool thing about that shield is that was a great protective thing, but then when you, 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 you combined and partnered your shield of faith with someone else's shield of faith, it became much bigger than what it initially is. They could stand side by side and interlock their, 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 their shields of faith, and they could actually walk through the ranks of an enemy untouched. Man, that's what we're called to do. That's why we're here. That's why we're gathering. That's why there's community. Because you know what? God has not called us to just walk this lone ranger. Me and Jesus got a good thing going. He's actually built us together as a family. And he's called us together because you know what? I need your shield. You need my shield. With our shield together, we, I mean, you know, if, if two can put a thousand to flight, or one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight, there's something that happens in the numbers of God's people coming together in faith. And it doesn't work. If I'm trying to, you know, have the whole armor of God and you're running around spiritually naked, that's weird. It's like, yeah, we're brothers, but you're naked. I got all this stuff. Man, I don't know how close I want you to get in my shield, bro. That's just weird. Okay, you can't unthink that now. But think about this. Think about just faith. I was talking to the guys Thursday night at Armor Up, and one of the things that just dropped in my spirit was that somebody that's walking in faith can totally change the atmosphere of a room full of fear. I mean, it's crazy how it works. But you've got a room full of fear and somebody walks in there with the shield of faith and it changes the perspective because now people start seeing things the way that God sees them. An example of that is John chapter 20 where the disciples are huddled in fear. And Jesus just appears in the room. And suddenly, the atmosphere has changed. What, what atmosphere are you cultivating? Are you cultivating an atmosphere of faith and being an overcomer? And like, yeah, I know it's tough, but you know, my God still moves mountains. Yeah, it's difficult, but my God still restores. It's tough, but I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is not going to bother me. I'm not going to let this thing bother me because I've got the full, the whole armor of God on. Somebody needs to say amen to that. Amen. You know, I don't know. Sometimes I go on these little rabbit trails. Sometimes you segue into something. The segue is just a fancy name for rabbit trail. But I got to thinking about Jesus the body, I mean his body. You know, here's this resurrection body, which I believe illustrates the kind of body that we're going to have. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, but that was really super cool. Because he, I mean, he was still flesh and blood, right? I mean, they touched him, they saw the scars. Thomas touched his wounds. He still ate. I mean, he, he, he made breakfast for the boys down at the beach and he ate fish. That's really cool. Wow, so when I'm thinking, I imagine a lot, I've like had this great imagination. I'm thinking that would have, that would be so awesome. So I'm still gonna be able to eat in heaven. <laughs> cool. And I can go through closed doors. I mean, think about this. I remember talking to an old pastor, he's with the Lord now, 
And I, and I asked him, I said, so what do you think, how old do you think our heavenly body is going to be like this? You know, this, this, you know, we put off the old earth tent, we get the new, you know, heavenly one. He says, I think it's going to be somewhere between 30 and 33 years old, of age because that's how old Jesus was when he walked the earth. I'm like, that is really cool, man, because I was in really good shape when I was 30. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. I could still dunk a basketball, climb every mountain. That's awesome. I'm going to be eating, going through, transporting. This is so cool. Anyway, let me get back to the message. Helmet of salvation. This protects how you think. The helmet of salvation. Protection of the mind and speak of the powers, speaks to the powers of thought. So much of what we speak today is defined by what we think and what we think too often is framed by our emotions instead of the Word of God. One of the most important components of salvation is hope. It's hope. It, you, can't, you can't separate hope from salvation. Christ in you is the hope. And so when, when we think about that, oh my goodness, what we have is a commodity that you can't buy in the world today. Think about hope. You are walking chest hope if Jesus lives in you. Wherever you go, you have this hope. I mean, seriously, you got this hope. You walk into that room full of fear, that room full of division, that room full of despair, and you got like, you have this hope. You can't separate it. And, and, and putting on the helmet of salvation moves your mind under the provision of the blood of Christ. It's like I'm taking, it allows the Lord to penetrate your thought process and radically change some of the stinking thinking that we basically walk in. It's like, I don't like the way that I'm thinking. I'm going to bring that under. I'm going to put the helmet of salvation on understanding the provision of Jesus through the cross will allow me to think different. It says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus will renew your mind by his word. Man, I'm so grateful for that. It says in 2 Corinthians, 10, 4 through 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, here's that flesh again, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every, oh, wait a minute, Pastor, I thought you said we weren't arguing. We're not arguing against flesh and blood. It says, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take thought every captive to obey Christ. Man, I'm telling you what, there's a lot of believers today that need to be taking some thoughts captive. Because we're running around like a bunch of half-naked spiritual people and we're not doing anybody any good. We've got, we, we've got to bring this in and understand what the full armor, the whole armor of God is. Most of the warfare raged against us starts in your mind. And that's the importance of the helmet. For example, the person who struggles continually with thoughts of rejection, they become self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you've, you've come out of a, a, a situation where maybe you were abandoned, you know, as a child, you didn't have a father, and, and what happens is that it can put a kind of a, re, a, a wound in you, a rejection in you. And then every time you turn around, there's something that's actually going to confirm that. You've got to bring that thinking underneath the helmet of salvation. You've got to realize, no, I may not have had it the greatest here on earth, but I got the greatest in heaven. I may not have had it down here, but I've got it up here. And I can appropriate that now. I can understand now what that feels like. There's something where I don't have to tolerate that. Or fearful suggestions that come in, they can lead to fearful living. They can. Or maybe you're struggling with healing. Maybe you're just struggling with, man, I just got so much stuff going on in my body. You know, that's when the sword of the Spirit comes into play. That's when the Word of God reminds you. Like, oh, I'm rejected. No, the Bible says I'm accepted. Well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a terrible person. Therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
I can't believe the way that I used to be and am I still that way? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. I began to actually war against some of that stuff with the Word of God. That's what Jesus did. And you got to war that way. Or, or man, I don't know how I'm going to get through this physical thing that I'm walking through. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with everlasting kindness and mercy, and gives your life good things so that your youth may be restored. Man, I memorized that because I was walking through some physical stuff, and I had to war with the sword of the Spirit. That's good preaching, somebody. Not bad for three months off. Jesus, you get all the glory. That's the sword of the Spirit. Paul tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of Christ which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Whoa. Man, I don't know though. The Bible tells us not to worry. Jesus said, what man by worrying can add one cubit to his life? I'm like, what's a cubit? Well, cubit is a very deep theological term to measure distance. I'm kind of messing with you. But, you know, I find, okay, what's a cubit? I'm, you know, well, a cubit is actually the distance if you make a hand like this and the distance between here and your elbow, that's a cubit. Like 1.5 feet. Unless you got short arms, you know. It's like... So Jesus is saying, what man by worrying can add 1.5 feet to his life? And then he points out this. He said, look at the birds of the field. They don't sow. They don't reap. And Solomon... Look at the lilies of the field. Psalm was never displayed in the glory like that. Why are you worrying? Worrying is unnatural. Worrying is demonic. You know why I say that? Because everything that God created, there's only one thing that God created that worries, and that's mankind. And he didn't start worrying until the fall in the garden. And then he began to worry. It's not meant for us. I'm not saying it's easy. We, we get caught up in worrying. We get sold things because we worry. You better have this. You better have that because that might happen. I mean, it's a constant thing that we're battling about. Does that mean you have your head in the sand and you don't do natural? I, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that too many times what it looks like to me is the squirrel in my backyard grabs a nut or a pine cone, right? You've seen it. Doesn't change anything. It's not natural. We're not created for it. That's, that's putting on the whole armor of God. And finally, part of this process is praying because we see that at the end of that passage of Scripture. It says, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, and supplication. There's something about this that we've got to understand. We, man, I hate, I, I, I always want to encourage and build people up. But we can have a prayerless church. You know, they say the average average Christian prays no more than about five, six minutes a week. A week. Man, I'm telling you, prayer is one of the most incredible gifts, responsibilities, and opportunities that we have. I mean, what relationship do you know that would prosper without communication? Robbie, we've been married for 41 years. I'm not going to talk to you for the rest. Um, six minutes. Six minutes a week. I wouldn't be married for 42 years. It's not going to work. Prayer is also 
I read, I've heard it say, and I wrote it down. I've heard it said that God puts in the hands of man the affairs of the earth. And then the responsibility that we have is to actually pray heaven to earth. We see that. Jesus said, pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where we're pulling down and we're, 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 we're speaking with God and something changes in our atmosphere, in our region. We cultivate something because we're actually in communication with God. And yet we, can, we can't do that if we're prayerless. You reflect the culture that you spend the most time in. If you're spending time in a heavenly culture, you're going to reflect the things of God. If you don't put on the full armor of God and you're walking around spiritually naked, you're not effective. You don't change anything. And I know it's hard. Jesus' disciples found it hard to pray. He came out and he said, could you not pray for one hour? He realized how important it was. But we have this ministry of prayer and interceding. See, an intercessor believes that prayer, the prayer of God can change and intersect any situation. And we actively call on God to do so. We're calling on God. I'm calling on God right now. Lord, would you break depression in this room? Lord, would you you demolish cancer in this room? You're the God who not only forgives all of my iniquities, but heals all my diseases. Lord, would would you deliver people right now from just addictions? Would you deliver people from just this just, just assault on their mind where they, they can't bring their thoughts under this, this place of peace? I'm just praying right now from, for heaven to come in and touch your earth. I pray against a spirit of fear. Uh, you know, Paul wrote, uh, you've not been given a spirit of fear. So that must mean there is a spirit of fear. And we're all, God, we, it just touches us. Like, <laughs> power, love sound mind. I start feeling fearful. No, wait a minute. Uh -uh. That's not what it's called. It says, I've been given not a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. There's some translations that take the word um, spirit and actually translate it as attitude. And I, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't see that. It's like, there's a spirit, man. You can feel it. You can feel it when you go to your grocery store. You can feel it when you go to your restaurant. You can feel it when you, when you walk in someplace. And I'm telling you what, this is when you take the shield of faith because you've got the whole armor of God and you walk in there and you change the circumstances. You're not trying to be some cocky, weird Christian dude. You're just trying to walk in there and say, hey man, I know a God. He overcomes. He still moves mountains. He still parts the sea. My God still heals. Listen, God's not up ringing in heaven, wringing his hands, worrying about what's happening. He's actually, his eyes on you. He's going, okay, those those are my people. Those are my children. Those are my sons. Those are my daughters. I've, I've empowered them with the Holy Spirit. I've given them the word of God, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, a feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And now they're going to change the world. They're going to change that culture, that atmosphere, because they're my kids. This is kingdom stuff. And finally, he says, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of God. I'm reminded in Samuel of David where it said he strengthened himself in the Lord. When we do this, when we come together, when we worship together, when we pray together, when we pray for one another, when we're encouraging each other with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, we're actually being strengthened in the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Let me just pray for you. Father God, right now, I just, I thank you. I thank you for people that are with us online. I thank you for people that are here this morning. I just pray that there's just a, just a faith just a faith, just a fresh faith that just moves out. Fresh trust. God, you, you're an amazing God. I pray people would put on the whole armor of God. Finally, 
Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in His might. And put on the whole armor of God. Man, you've got this equipment room that's amazing if we will just walk in it. And finally, I want to give you an opportunity this morning, today, if you've never, you know that scripture we read that says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit and you, 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 can, you can feel that there's a God. Maybe, maybe you've heard about God. Maybe you've even you know, been kind of aware of God working in your life, but you've never taken that step to say, I want to become a follower today. I'm going to profess and confess. I'm going to believe in my heart and I'm going to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Man, this is the day for you. If you have not done it, can I just encourage you? It's life. Jesus said this. He said, I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. He's got an amazing purpose for you. If that's you this morning, nobody's looking around except me. I I just want to, I want to honor that commitment. And if that's you this morning and you're saying, today I want to give my life to this Jesus pastor, I want you to just raise your hand and just kind of wave at me. Just make sure I see. I want to agree with you. It's really important. Just, you know, and it, it, Jesus said this, in the mouth of two or three, let everything be established. So is there somebody here this morning you'd say, today I want to, I want that journey. I want the journey. I want to start that journey. I want to accept the invitation. I'm not rejected. I'm accepted. If you're online with us and that's your decision, I think there's a link you can, you can, um, you can click on and just let us know that today's the day. Amen.